How brass instruments work. Does the musician play the instrument or does the instrument play the musician? On Saturday, we discussed a brass instrument at a tube containing air. The air is excited by blowing through buzzing lips. Sound is reflected at both ends, so sound waves travel up and down the tube. Some sound escapes from the open end. This is what we hear, but most is reflected. For a note in the middle of the playing range, the sound pressure inside the instrument can be a thousand times higher than the sound pressure level just beyond the end of the bell. What happens to the reflected sound waves? They travel back and reach the lips of the player. If the high pressure phase of the wave arrives when the player's lips are open, it adds to the pressure and reinforces the sound. A strong and stable note is built up. However, if the low pressure phase of the wave arrives when the player's lips are open, it cancels out the high pressure puff of air and is not reflected again. Whether the sound inside the instrument builds up or not depends on the length of the tube, the speed of sound, and the time between puffs, that is, on the frequency of the sound. The frequency of sound is perceived by the human ear as pitch. The reflected sound waves also act directly on the player's lips and can force them to open or close. Players are not conscious of this, but they are aware that some pitches can be sounded on brass instrument while others can't. So although the musician plays the instrument, the instrument also plays the musician. Sound waves can be reflected from end to end of the tube more than once between puffs, so there is a series of stable notes available to the player. These are called the natural notes, and they are the notes that can be played on a natural instrument, such as a bugle or a natural trumpet. Here is an experiment you can do with your own instrument. Sound the pitch written A on a treble clef instrument or the pitch G on a trombone by buzzing the lips on a mouthpiece detached from the instrument. Then attempt to continue playing this note while inserting the mouthpiece into the instrument. It is difficult or impossible to sustain the lip vibration at this pitch once the coupling to the instrument is made, because this note is intermediate between the third and fourth natural notes of the instrument, written G and C or F and B flat on a trombone. And this is now being demonstrated. In this experiment, it is difficult or impossible to sustain the lip vibration of pitch G once the coupling to the instrument is made, because this note is intermediate between the third and fourth natural notes of the instrument. The feedback from the instrument exerts a strong guidance on the lips towards the vibration either the natural note below or the natural note above. If the lips are buzzed at the pitch of a natural note while inserting the mouthpiece, the sound is stabilized and reinforced by the coupling to the instrument. Musicians refer to this phenomenon as slotting. We can hear a demonstration now of the sound being reinforced when it's 
at uh, one of the pitches of the natural notes. <laughs> Whether the sound inside the instrument builds up or not depends on the length of the tube and the time between puffs or the frequency of the sound. Changing the length of the tube changes the frequencies at which strong notes can be played. Tone holes, as on the serpent, slides, as on the trombone, and valves allow the player's will to change the sounding length of the tube. Tone holes effectively shorten the tube while slides lengthen the tube. Valves usually, but not always, lengthen the tube. Instruments with one of these devices can play a full range of notes, more notes than can be played easily on a bugle or a natural trumpet. Now we have another demonstration. We can hear that the sound quality of a brass instrument note changes as a note gets louder. It is not just an increase in sound output, like turning up the volume on a radio, but an actual change in sound quality or timbre. The brightening of sound is called technically spectral enrichment, and it is more noticeable in loud playing. It is also more noticeable in the trombone than the euphonium. These diagrams show the ball profiles of the euphonium and the trombone as if the bends were straightened out. Bends in the tubing don't affect sound very much. They are there to make the instruments a manageable shape. The brightening of the sound, or spectral enrichment, is a phenomenon found only in brass instruments, not in woodwind. In long, narrow tubes, the energy in the sound wave is converted from low frequencies to high frequencies as a sound wave travels the length of the tube. Although the tubes with trombone in first position and a euphonium with no valves operated are more or less the same, the trombone has more narrow tubing, which constrains the sound waves in the instrument, while the tubing of the euphonium has more wide tubing, which allows the sound waves to open out as they travel from mouthpiece to bell. This effect accounts for the difference in sound between euphoniums and trombones, and much of the character of all the other brass instruments too. Here is another experiment you can do with your own instrument. Simply play the natural notes from lowest to as high as possible. What happens as the pitches get higher and higher? The notes get more difficult to play and the pitches become less well defined. When a brass instrument is being played, sound is reflected at both ends, so sound waves travel up and down the tube. Some sound escapes from the opened air, this is what we hear, but most is reflected. Sound energy levels can be deafeningly high inside the instrument, but only a small fraction of the energy escapes. High frequency sound escapes more easily than low frequency sound. 
while low frequency sound is reflected at the bell more and reinforces the action of the buzzing lips. The higher a musician plays, the more sound energy is radiated from the bell, but less is reflected to stabilize the pitch. Actual brass instruments are designed to give a useful playing range of several octaves, but for all instruments, the useful range ends when very high notes become too difficult. If you have strong embouchure muscles and can play very high notes, you will find that the slotting effect disappears in a very high register and you can play a continuous spread of pitches. another experiment you can do with your own instrument. Play a low note in a normal way. Then keeping your lips in the same setting, breathe very gently through the instrument without using your tongue and increase the airflow. At a certain point your lips will start vibrating and a note will sound. Repeat this for a high note. You can feel that the air pressure in your lungs and mouth needed to sound a high note is greater than the air pressure needed to sound a low note. Scientists can measure this threshold pressure and interestingly, it seems to depend only on the pitch of the note and not on the kind of instrument. If you can play the same note on a trumpet and on a tuba, the threshold pressure at which the sound starts will be much the same. Of course, this is not the normal way to start a note, even a quiet note. There is too little control over when it will start to sound. Here is an experiment that trombonists can do. Take off the slide section and play the natural notes of the bell section on its own. So a trombone bell can be detached from the slide and placed the brass instrument by buzzing the lips against the tube entrance. We can hear that the natural notes are not what we usually expect from a brass instrument, but have wider intervals. Many people believe that all brass instruments play the same series of natural notes, but this isn't true. Our familiar orchestral and band instruments only play the same series because they are carefully engineered to do so. Other instruments, such as the ancient Greek Salpinx or the Roman Lituas, play different series. <laughs> Playing a brass instrument requires some effort. What happens to all the energy you put into blowing? Only a small part of the sound energy inside the instrument is radiated from the bell, so most of your work goes into heating the air inside the instrument and the walls of the instrument itself. As the radiated sound energy, most ends up heating the air if you're playing outdoors or heating the walls if you're playing indoors. The energy reaching the ears of your audience is tiny, even when you play as loud as you can. Luckily, our ears are very sensitive and the range of dynamics produced by a brass instrument is well matched with the sound energy levels it is enjoyable to hear. Thank you.
On Saturday, we discussed how the material of which a brass instrument is made is relatively unimportant. A related question is how much the vibration of an instrument affects the sound produced. When a brass instrument is played sufficiently loudly, the instrument itself responds to the high levels of internal sound energy and players can sense the vibrations. Vibrations of the bell can be particularly strong and can be expected to radiate sound like a loudspeaker cone. Here again, many experiments have been done to assess whether this effect is of any importance. One experiment carried out in the University of Le Mans in France measured the vibrations of the bell of a trumpet while it's being played, at the same time recording the sound of the trumpet. The player was then replaced by a mechanical shaker which was attached to the instrument body and driven by a computer-generated signal, which created the same amplitude of bell vibration as that measured during the playing test. Again, the radiated sound was measured. Since in the second test, there were no sound waves in the instrument, the only sound source was the bell vibration. The sound intensity from the bell itself was one ten thousandth of the sound intensity from the trumpet being played. The sound radiated from the bell on its own was audible, but in playing, the bell vibration makes an insignificant contribution to the overall sound output. The player who is in contact with the instrument with the lips and hands can feel vibrations and may be affected by them. And vibration of the instrument tubing may have an effect on the air inside. Scientists continue to investigate these phenomena, which may be detected by an experienced player, while having no effect on the listener in the audience. Thanks very much, Arnold, for a fabulously interesting uh, presentation, especially to a uh, we brass players who've spent our whole lives uh, wondering how uh, the, the things work. Discussing Arnold Meyer's presentation, How Brass Works, we have Trevor Herbert, historian from the Royal College of Music, Peter Holmes, music archaeologist from the University of Middlesex, myself, John Wallace, and members of the Wallace Collection, John Miller, Fergus Kerr, Paul Stone, Tony George, and Bede Williams, who is also head of instrumental studies at the Laidlaw Music Centre at the University of St Andrews. Now to kick off the questions. Arnold, something that has always puzzled me, why do brass instruments sound so loud, particularly to the viola section sitting in front of you, when so little energy reaches the human ear? Well, the ear is very sensitive to sound. The quietest sounds you can hear and the loudest sounds you can hear, uh, the energy levels are tens of thousands of times more in the loud sounds. Brass instruments are particularly efficient at um, producing sounds towards the loud end of what the human ear can tolerate and enjoy. They're not necessarily the loudest instruments in terms of producing sound energy. Um, some reed instruments are louder, and in terms of energy produced, the bass drum is the loudest orchestral instrument. Thank you, Arnold. Now, I saw Trevor hastily scribbling notes during your presentation, so <laughs> Trevor, you've got probably very many questions for Arnold too. Um, the first one is, um, you, you say that it, it, it doesn't, that the material of, of which a brass instrument is made doesn't really matter very much. I mean, that's what the, the science tells us. 
but emotionally, I would find it very difficult to play an instrument which is made of um, of blue cheese, for example. <laughs> so, is there? Um, uh, I mean, how far can we take take that? I mean, we know that some lip vibrated instruments were pl were made of wood, were made of ivory, but metal seems to be very important. Um, is it really the case that in the from the scientific point of view, metal holds no favoritism against any other sort of material that a brass instrument might be made of? Well, as we discussed on Saturday, uh, tests, objective tests by blindfold players find very little difference between one kind of metal and another. Um, but there's a big psychological difference between holding a metal instrument and a wooden instrument or a human thigh bone, and this can't be discounted. Um, even if the actual sounds as can be measured by scientific equipment are very close or indeed exactly the same, if the player is happier playing one instrument or another, this is translated into music too. And um, uh, there's a whole area of study called psychoacoustics, which tries to look at the experiences of musicians playing different instruments, uh, which can be uh, a bigger variation than the actual sounds uh, which could be heard in a blindfold test. Can I, can I just um, extend that a little bit by, um, by asking you about the instruments that uh, we all play today? Now, when I was um, playing for a living, when I, I didn't do anything else except play before I came down in the world, I, I, um, I had instruments which were very expensive and I had instruments which were less expensive, particularly old instruments made in the 19th century, for example. And some of them were, were very good and some of them were less good. My question really is why, what is it that makes instruments good instruments? And what is it that um, does the opposite, that makes them bad? Now assume, for example, that the instrument is, let's say, a trumpet. Let's say that uh, in most trumpets, the valves work perfectly well, and the slides for tuning the instrument go in and out, and they're capable of adjusting the intonation of the instruments. Um, and if you actually put aside the emotional thing, that uh, you feel an instrument is better because it costs more than a thousand pounds, for example, um, what is it that makes an instrument a good instrument and what is it that stops an instrument from being a good instrument from the acoustic point of view um, other than what the manufacturers tell us about them because i've always found this you know extraordinarily interesting that um, that that fashions lead among professional players for example i mean when i was playing in london every single trombone player in london played an instrument made by the Conn Company, a particular model called the 8H. Every single trombone player in every single orchestra, except one, the first trombone at, the, at Sadler's Wells. Um, so what is it acoustically that defines a, a, a good instrument? And what do the manufacturers do that makes instruments better than, or different at least, than um, their competitor instruments? Well, this is a rather complicated question, and it's an area of ongoing research. And um, some research has been done into how players assess instruments and the kind of words they use to describe the quality of instruments. And uh, uh, in some cases, a particular instrument would be found to be a good instrument by one player, but not others. In other cases, an instrument will be good, found to be good by all the players who have a go at playing it. The things which um, a manufacturer can do to make an instrument good, um, the main thing is getting the bore profile to be optimal. 
Um, the natural notes of the instrument uh, need to be such that they can be easily played in tune uh, at all dynamics and with all positions of the trombone slide or the valve settings. And this isn't a simple thing, there's a compromise to be had and um, some manufacturers reach one compromise and others might reach another. So um, uh, if there were a simple answer to this, um, all manufacturers would be, by now be making the same instrument and um, it wouldn't be a research question anymore. Yeah, it's interesting. I, some years ago, I went to the United States to do some research on the, the, the factory archives of the Con Company, which is one of the big manufacturing uh, companies in the United States. And the Con Company, I think, was one of the first ones to employ acousticians, uh, an, an, an acoustic laboratory to advise them. And what they seem to be trying to do is to make the timbre of the sound, that is the quality of the sound, more or less the same across the entire range of the instrument, whether it was a very low note or a very high note, and whether the instrument was played very quietly or, or very loudly. So it would have a consistency of sound across the entire pitch and dynamic range. And I was quite interested in this because when I played the con instruments, I, I could feel that uh, that was what they were trying to do because you could feel it as you played the instrument. But of course, in the past, it wasn't like that because when you played an instrument, a high note on say a trombone and you played it loud, it would sound very brassy. It's a particular uh, sort of type, I suppose, of spectral enhancement that, it, that the, the sound of it changes. And that means that the instruments which we play in modern times don't actually sound the same as they did in the 19th century, for example, um, by design, because the the, what the instrument manufacturers are aiming for uh, in the 20th century is something quite different than was being aimed for in the 19th century. Do you think that's uh, correct or have I, is it one of the many occasions when I've misunderstood it? Well, it's certainly true that uh, 19th century instruments often sound quite different from 20th century instruments. And this is largely because dynamic levels have risen in musical performance and instruments are expected to sound louder these days to produce more volume of sound uh, than they were in the 19th century when dynamic levels were lower. Mm. The Con Company is to be commended on having an acoustical laboratory and they did some very valuable work on acoustics um, in the middle of the 20th century. How much effect this had on the instruments they produced um, is an open question. Certainly the con instruments are in many cases very good instruments. Um, but um, the translation of acoustical research into instrument design is not straightforward. Uh, the, in the 19th century, there was a lot of advertising by the Besson company um, which said that uh, Gustav August Bessel, their founder, was a genius in the science of acoustics. And indeed, he may have studied acoustics. But in other accounts of the Bessel Company's procedures, uh, it's described how in introducing a new design of instrument, they made a lot of prototypes, all slightly different, and then chose the best one and uh, proceeded by trial and error which has been the way brass instruments have been designed until I would say the last 30 or 40 years when acoustics has finally developed to a point uh, where um, acoustical considerations and modeling can help the design of an instrument. And yes. some of the instruments which um, Peter has been involved in, archaeological reconstructions, have cut out a lot of this trial and error by 
having computer simulations of the acoustical characteristics done uh, before actually an instrument was made. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. I, I'll, I'll hand back to John now, so there's several other people who want to ask questions. I might come back to you with a yet more difficult question later on. Yeah, they're all flying in now. Uh, first, can we go to Peter for your questions first? Yeah, okay. I've got a question about the French horn. You talked about the difference between the, the tone colour, the sound of the, the uh, trombone versus the euphonium. One's essentially cylindrical, one's essentially conical. I'm, I wonder about the French horn, these big double French horns that have enough plumbing in them for the Titanic. Um, <laughs> When you bring all that into play, can you really get the horn sound that you used to get on the old single horns? Or is it a different instrument? Is it no longer essentially a cylindrical instrument? Is it now a conical one? <clears throat> well, I think that the classification into cylindrical and conical um, is not always helpful, um, but it can be a first step. Uh, the modern French horn, like the other orchestral instruments, is designed to produce sound at a higher dynamic output than the 19th century instruments. Uh, the question of the French horn, of course, is slightly complicated by the fact that the player puts the hand into the bell of the instrument, which can be used not only to adjust the intonation, but also the timbre of the instrument. Um, in terms of brassiness, the French horn is intermediate between the euphonium and the trombone. So at extremes of playing, the horn can be as brassy as any brass instrument. Uh, but in quiet playing, it can be as mellow and gentle as any brass instrument. Can we bring our horn player, Fergus Karen now, just to <laughs> talk to you, uh, Arnold? Yes. Before I go on, I'd, I'd like to add something to the, the blind trombone uh, question. I had an experience a few years ago where my, my French horn is a, a gold brass instrument made by Alexander in Germany. And I was having some repairs getting done on it and I was working with an orchestra and the, um, I borrowed an identical model to this, another Alexander 103, which was yellow brass. And I was sitting in this horn section playing, I can't remember, I think it might have been some Strauss. And uh, so I was playing quite loud and um, I suddenly felt, wow, someone in the section is absolutely obliterating the entire orchestra here. Uh, and then to my uh, shame, I realized it was me. Um, and the thing was, from my perception, I was playing at exactly the same energy level as I would do on my gold brass instrument. But somehow on this yellow brass instrument, it seemed to be just so much more lively. Um, and so th there seems to be a much, much higher degree of, of spectral dissonance. Um, the question I was going to ask was also to do with the position of the right hand, because, you know, as Peter was talking about, obviously, we have um, the ability to use it um, to change notes and to change the timbre of the instrument. Um, I think when I do demonstrations for children, it's probably the question that I'm asked most frequently is why do I put my, my hand in the bell? And obviously I'll explain that it's a, a kind of a, a hangover from the days when we used to use our, our hand to create extra notes on the instrument. Um, but something I heard recently by Engelbert Schmidt, who's another uh, German, Germanic horn maker, was that the position of the right hand in the bell actually has the effect of creating the end of the tubing. That the, basically the, the profile of the bell and the horn is deliberately designed to be less efficient than perhaps um, a trombone or a trumpet, where there's a very clear end of the actual length of the instrument. And that the effect of putting your hand in the bell essentially creates a physical um, end of the length of that instrument. Um, the way that this characterizes is that if I play high notes um, without my hand in the bell, the kind of the lack of slotting is even more pronounced. Whereas when I then put my hand into its normal position, um, it makes a, the definition of high notes much more precise. Is that a, a correct assessment? That's a correct assessment. And of course, the fact of putting your hand in the bell is to increase the effective length of the instrument. Unless you put it right in and do hand stopping, in which case it shortens the length of the instrument. Um, 
picking up your point of the different Alexander horns, of course, it's an assumption that the bore profiles of two instruments, even by the same maker of the same model, are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to be said about player assessment of instruments is that the player is much more sensitive to what is going on in an instrument than a member of the audience. The player feels the vibrations. The player has an ear close to the instrument and, and hears uh, radiation for the instrument, which um, the audience doesn't hear. Um, so players' assessment of instruments, when they know what they're doing, um, could not necessarily be replicated in blindfold tests by listeners. Maybe it could in some cases, or maybe not in others. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Arnold and Fergus. We've now got a question about Pythagoras from Bede. Um, I just wanted to ask Arnold about Pythagorean um, tuning, well, not tuning, but the harmonic series, because I'd always understood um, that, uh, well, ra rather assumed that um, the harmonic series was like a fixed thing in the universe, and that if you blew into a tube, that you would get that harmonic series out. But um, from having experimented playing shells recently, I've realized that's not the case. And Peter touched on that in his presentation last week about the ancient instruments, which all have their own harmonic series. Um, maybe I'm just a little bit slow to understand, but is there any way that you could um, explain how there is a different harmonic series, even though we have one fixed one of the universe, supposedly? Well, uh, I didn't mention the word harmonic in my presentation because it's a concept which has caused a lot of confusion um, with brass players and other people. And um, I can say a little bit about that. Um, if you have a trombone player, playing a low G at the bottom of the bass clef, their lips are opening and closing a hundred times a second. And that means they're emitting little puffs of air into the instrument a hundred times a second. Um, this can support um, oscillations in the air column, not only at a hundred times a second, but also 200 times a second, 300 times a second, 400 times a second, Exactly, because the puffs of air will coincide with when the high pressure path of the wave returns to the mouthpiece. So when a brass instrument player uh, plays, a, say, a low G, the sound which is produced by the instrument is not just at 100 uh, vibrations per second, but at a mixture of 100, 200, 300, 400. And if they're playing a steady note, uh, then these are exact numbers. It's a law of the universe that um, the puffs of air wouldn't support a vibration of the air column at 201 vibrations per second. It has to be 100, 200, 300. So this is the harmonic series. These are the harmonics. And um, every note on the brass instrument or any wind instrument or any instrument producing sound continuously like a bowed stringed instrument or the human voice, the sound is composed of components, harmonic components at these set frequencies. Now, when you're listening to an instrument being played, you don't usually hear these as separate frequencies or separate notes. The human ear has a capacity to fuse all these into one sensation. So the ear and the brain interpreting what the ear hears, hears um, a harmonic series of notes of a single sound with a certain sound quality. It's a lot of energy in the high harmonics, then it's heard as a bright sound. Um, this is part of the, probably arises from human evolution where one wanted to hear your baby crying or animals from the forest or or something and detect these as single sounds. But that's um, a phenomenon of sound production on instruments and the human ear. When we talk about the notes you can play on a brass instrument, the natural notes, on some instruments, 
these approximate closely to a harmonic series of frequencies, but not necessarily. On your conch shell and on the salpinx and the lituus and the trombone with the just the bell section, uh, the series of notes is not a harmonic series. So uh, although musicians often refer to these notes as harmonics, they're not using the word in an accurate sense. In that case, harmonic is really more of a target than what happens. It's a target for the instrument maker to make an instrument where the natural notes are close to a harmonic series and close enough so the musician can bend them up or down to produce the intonation needed. Thank you, Arnold. Now we know. Right, John Miller, you have a question. Um, I, I've been very impressed over the last year in playing the poly polycarbonate trumpets that everybody involved in beginner brass plays. You know, th these instruments, they feel very good, they respond very good, and um, they're also indestructible and so on. Now, is there any viability in making um, um, valved instruments out of polycarbonate as well? Now, if that was the case, would the mechanisms be made from polycarbonate or would metal be um, necessary to make the, the valves more durable? And I'm just wondering if you have any, more, any, any sort of general thoughts on this. Yes, I'm glad you asked about the polycarbonate trumpets. Um, if some parts of it are made of metal, it wouldn't make very much difference. Um, if you look at American sousaphones, some of those are artificial materials with metal valves, and they still sound like sousaphones. Using plastic or polycarbonate or fiberglass may mean you end up with an instrument which isn't quite as good as, a, um, as an old brass one, but it still sounds like the same kind of instrument. Uh, with the polycarbonate trumpets, I was lucky to be involved in a slight redesign of these instruments. When they were first made, the um, expanding part of the bell section was so short that the natural notes of the instrument were further away from a harmonic series than is desirable. So I was able to suggest a slight redesign of the instrument, uh, moving the expansion of the uh, tubing slightly to make them sound a bit better in tune. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Paul, Paul Stone, you have a question. I do, yes, thanks. Um, life, um, life performance has been suspended uh, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and last week, the UK government released guidance for uh, socially distanced professional performance. Uh, we are doing our first uh, performances under these guidelines in October. Um, now I'm the, the new COVID-19 supervisor for the, <laughs> for the group. <laughs> Um, but as a scientist, uh, what can you tell us about the present state of the scientific research or the science around um, airflow and aerosols uh, in and around brass instruments? Well, this is a very important topic and um, it hasn't been researched fully, but initial tests have been done. Um, we need to distinguish between the sound wave uh, which is emitted from the bell of an instrument at the speed of sound um, and the steady flow of air which the player puts in through breathing and which comes out of the end of the bell eventually. Um, the, uh, the sound waves emitted from a brass instrument come out at high velocity but they are just air moving backwards and forwards the sound waves don't transmit droplets or um, aerosols at all. They're just vibrations which move. Um, the actual flow of the air through a, a brass instrument, even when playing quite loud, um, is um, no more than speaking loudly, 
and certainly a lot less than coughing or sneezing. So I think the dangers of brass instrument playing have been greatly exaggerated by some people. I think so too. I remember a while ago now by Richard Smith from Smith Watkins Trumpets. He did a, an experiment with me and he, he had put a diaphragm across the back of the mouthpiece so the air couldn't actually go into the instrument and there was a runoff through a drilled hole mm -hmm. in the mouthpiece. And at the time, it was, let's say it's 25 years ago, it kind of changed my whole yes. understanding of brass instruments just in one sort of swift blow. But thanks for the answer. That's uh, fantastic. Yes, the sole purpose of blowing air into a brass instrument is to excite the lips to vibrate. It plays no part in the sound itself mm -hmm. and, um, and is much less than it's commonly thought. Thank you very much, Arnold. That's very reassuring. Right, Tony, you've remained silent all the time. Let's hear from you now. Thank you very much. Arnold, over your lifetime, you must have collected so many different instruments and all sorts of incredible things. If you could only have one instrument, what would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> well, my favourite instrument, without doubt, is the G-bass trombone. <laughs> this is very out of fashion. I started playing the G trombone when it was still widely played in brass bands, uh, but was definitely on the way out. And whether my playing the G trombone was an early revival or a late or a hangover from the late period is an open question. But I just love the big brassy sound you can get from that. For people who don't know, the G trombone is a longer instrument than the normal trombone. The normal trombone is about nine feet of tube. The G bass trombone is 11 feet of tube and um, was a standard orchestral and band instrument for over a century. That's wonderful. I remember Ron Bryans, who played G trombone in The Origin of the Species, saying that in the olden times it was called the Rose of England. It made such a beautiful sound. <laughs> and if you want to hear that beautiful sound, listen to the last note of the lost chord when Ron just puts a crescendo in and it could cut through absolutely anything that sound but still retains some sense of beauty but on that note shall we return to trevor just uh, any last thoughts from you trevor well i just wanted to give an appendix to what you said about ron bryan's playing the bass trombone in the um in the lost chord uh, i i urge people to listen to the the first note in the fourth bar of the introduction of that piece um, where the the sound of the, there is no instrument ever been invented that could actually make the type of sound that Ron Bryan's gets out of that. It's the it's the resolution onto the fourth bar of the lost chord in the bass trauma is absolutely wonderful. The the only question I've got to ask um, Arnold, which um, is a, is a very simple one actually, because I think that some of the people, who, well, several of the people who attend in the brass club, may be interested to know. Is there anything you can do to make your instrument better acoustically? For example, should we be regularly washing out the instrument uh, to take all the various pieces of vegetation from the inside of it? Or, um, or does it make no, 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 no difference at all? Well, the interior surface of the instrument is important. Uh, the rougher or softer it is, the more energy gets absorbed by the surface coating. So cleaning your instrument will uh, possibly have an effect. Whether it makes it better or worse, it's an open question. It's the same whether you, um, if you drop your instrument, put a dent into it, that can change the intonation of some notes. Um, it's usually thought that makes them worse, but maybe it makes them better in some cases. Uh, what players usually do to improve their instrument um, is just selecting a different mouthpiece, uh, which is such an important part of the instrument. And um, it's um, fairly easy to change from one mouthpiece to another and experiment with different mouthpieces. And this is more important than anything you do to the instrument itself. 
Thank you, Arnold. It's fascinating. Peter, do you have any last thoughts? Yeah, I think from my perspective, um, my great interest is really on the intentionality of these instruments and looking at if I can from making them, playing on them, feeling how they play, if I can understand any of the intentionality behind the changes in design. Uh, I, I, the Carnix I showed is my favourite instruments and it makes me whoop on it <laughs> because it is so easy to do that and it says to me, do this on it. So I think the instrument speaks to me and tells me to do it. The Salpinx tells me to play loud and with its great big bell, it plays really loud and I don't blow it as hard as I can indoors because it is so loud. So I think what uh, Arnold was saying that the instruments I find on these ancient instruments when I make them, they speak to me and they give me some feeling of what the intentionality behind them might have been. Wonderful. Thank you, Peter. Arnold, your final summing up. It's difficult to sum up all these things, um, but I've um, spent quite a long time studying the science of brass instruments, and um, it's been very rewarding to learn a little bit about what actually happens when you play a brass instrument. Whether that's made me a better player or not, I don't know, but I like to think that it has done. And I recommend to all brass camp participants to learn a little bit more about how their instruments work. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you very much. Let's give Arnold a great big round of applause. Excellent.